Okay, if you'll turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 8, I'll be in Acts chapter 8, at least for a time. And uh, while you open there, I'll get my uh, lapel on. Could have put this on before, but then Dr. Vogel said that Michael was controlling it, so I thought I better, uh, I don't know why I thought I better put it in the book. <laughs> Acts chapter 8, I was looking out at everybody uh, while I was sitting up there. You have a kind of a different perspective up here. Some of you look tired, and some of you look bored, <laughs> and some of you look uh, happy. There's a kind of a range of emotions here, I guess. But uh, I'm always amazed, sometimes it just strikes me uh, how, uh, where the Lord has brought me to. I, I come from nothing, and uh, God's, God's been very, very good to me, and he's been very good to you. And I'm sure if you got up here to, to give a testimony, you'd say the same thing. But God's good. He, he is good. And I appreciate the sermon this morning. And, uh, and uh, so it's been about two years ago now. Uh, hard to believe, that uh, Pastor Olson actually uh, preached the sermon. I listened to it today uh, and, uh, as I was preparing, and uh, he went off of the theme, bye-bye polio, and what he said was bye-bye bitterness. He preached on the topic of bitterness, and uh, I'm afraid that perhaps a lot of people didn't listen to that. Maybe I ought to go back and listen again. My topic today is bitterness. My question to you is that do you know what the root causes of bitterness are, and are you a bitter person? We're going to look at what the Bible says, and uh, I uh, admit, when we look at some of the characteristics of a bitter person, that steps on my toes, to be quite frank. I uh, maybe would tend that way, um, and, but it's never right. Uh, the word in uh, Greek is pakria. There's your Greek lesson, pakria. And, uh, sorry, pikria. Uh, here I was wrong. And uh, it's figurative in that uh, really it's not, it doesn't really talk about what, what that, that is, but rather it talks about, like in English, uh, we would say bitterness, right? And so bitter is that taste, really. Bitterness is really a taste, I think, right? But it's used figuratively to express that emotion. And uh, I uh, think everybody knows when, if you've eaten something bitter before, what it does to your face, you know, that kind of thing. Or if you've, uh, anyway, I'll get into some more of that. But I can remember being a young boy, and I was, grew, I grew up at a, this a lot of growing up, in uh, Dyer, Indiana. My grandfather had a farm there, five acres there. And he had, all, he had chickens and, and, and uh, all kinds of animals. Anyway, it was more of a ranch than a farm, and he had some bulls and things. And I'd be out there feeding the animals, and uh, I would watch the squirrels, and they would eat acorns. And they made it look like it might be tasty. <laughs> so I thought, I'm going to try, try an acorn. It's got to be, because they pack it in their mouth. It was the most bitter. I don't know if you've ever eaten an acorn before. <laughs> probably not. I'm probably the only lunatic that would have done something like that. But it is unbelievably bitter. And uh, I didn't uh, expect that at all. I thought it was going to be delicious, and it wasn't. And... Uh, at all, um, but that, that, the face, it, it makes you like that. And so it's very figurative, this meaning, the, the, when, uh, the idea of bitterness. A Scottish theologian years ago uh, defined what this picria means, and it is a figurative term denoting that fretted and irritable state of mind, fretted and irritable state of mind, that keeps a man in perpetual animosity that inclines him to harsh and uncharitable opinions of men and things that makes him sour, crabbed or crabby and repulsive in his general demeanor. <laughs> wow. That brings a scowl over his face and infuses venom <clears throat> into the words of his tongue. That was his definition of pikria in the Greek, in this idea of bitterness. If it is figurative, then I suppose that everything that uh, would be the figurative idea of you tasting something bitter 
Well, that's contained in that emotion, isn't it? Here in Acts chapter 8, if you're there, I'm going to begin in verse 20. And there it says, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Look at verse 23. This kind of stood out to me quite a while ago. But he says, therefore, I perceive, so it's something that he perceived. He says, I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So evidently, whatever Peter saw in this Simon the sorcerer, I don't know if it mentioned it was Simon, but we'll get to that. He saw that he was in the gall of bitterness. And also, he said, the bond of iniquity. <clears throat> so you think of bond of iniquity, gall of bitterness. Evidently, from this verse, if that's the only verse, and it's not, but if it was the only verse, I think we'd reach the conclusion that bitterness is binding, isn't it? And that binding is, is a bond of iniquity. And so it's a very serious thing. He goes on in 24, Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye, that the, ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages, of the Samaritans. Well, let's pray, and we'll get, uh, we'll get into the message, the gall of bitterness. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for <clears throat> your love for us, and I thank you for this opportunity. I truly do, Lord. Um, I, don't, uh, I, don't, I don't suppose that, that I've preached any time that, I, that it wasn't to me first. Um, even if it's a salvation message to, to, to um, make sure about that even in my own life. And so I'm thankful in a lot of ways to have this time together tonight. And uh, Lord, I, I feel like you've, you've led me to, to preach this. And so Lord, I don't know why I say that other than um, I, I rely on your power. And as a church member here at Fairhaven Baptist Church, a local church institution, I, I, I uh, rely on that power. And it's available because your spirit works in your church. And so, Lord, thank you for your love for us. And I think of all the people that are here and of all the people around the world that could be here tonight. <clears throat> you have us all here together. And I don't think it's by accident at all. And so, Lord, as I looked out on your congregation, I was reminded that it's your flock. It's yours. And uh, you have us here together. And I want very, very much open the eyes or cause us at least, at the very least, to remember what, what it means to be a member of a local church. And uh, so I pray that this particular sin that I'm going to try to deal with uh, is something that I think uh, could destroy our church, and I think even to some degree has. And so, Lord, um, I pray that you help us to see things. I, I'm going to try to be and try to preach the truth in love. And so I ask that your Holy Spirit would take these things and that you would make it important to people and uh, they would recognize you in all of this. And as many, I've heard many people say, take me out of the way. And so Lord, I pray that would be the case in Jesus' name. Amen. The history of this passage, so that we can get <coughs> kind of the context. In verse 1, we see that, uh, verse chapter 7, pardon me, Stephen was uh, persecuted. And so the stoning of Stephen just happened. We assume that this is somewhat uh, chronological. And so we get to chapter 8, verse 1, and we see there that Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was great persecution against the church. So there was this great persecution against the church, the church here being the church of Jerusalem. So it's a local church that's being referred to, but it's that church, and there was great persecution against the church. As a result, people from that church went out and started uh, fulfilling the Lord's commission elsewhere because of persecution. Undoubtedly, other churches were started. So this was the Lord's will. We get to verse 4 and it says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. This was the Lord inten Lord's intention. Uh, persecution was the way by, by which he, he did that. But people went out and they started to spread the word uh, of God and to preach the gospel er elsewhere. The Lord allowed this. Uh, part of that was uh, the ministry of Philip. Now he was a deacon in the church there at Jerusalem. And as in chapter 8 here, we see that he went to Samaria. And he started to preach the gospel there in Samaria. 
um, the power of God fell. It says that in verse 5, look there, then Philip went down to the city of, of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many of them and, uh, that were possessed with them, and they were taken with and, and they that were taken with palsies and that were lame and were healed, and there was a great joy in the city. So great things. Uh, people were saved. Miracles were witnessed. There was victory over Satan, and there was great joy. So this is the result of, of, of Philip preaching in Samaria. Great things were being done. Now, we know that from here he went to go uh, to the eunuch. Well, uh, that's later on in the chapter. But in the meantime, they heard. It was uh, said uh, what, was, what the Lord was doing in Samaria. And so then Peter and John came from Jerusalem to go and help Philip. And so they were all um, helping there and, and witnessing and doing the same things that, that Philip did. And there was one person there, and his name was Simon the sorcerer. Now, if you look at verse 9, it says here, but. So there was great joy in the city, right? In verse 8, all of these things were happening, but. Dot, 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 dot. There was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria. Now this word sorcery, in the Bible many times, that's pharmacia, pharmakeia, <coughs> as it is in Revelation 21, but not this one. This word is mageo, we get our word magic from this. And so evidently he was performing uh, magic, magic, okay? And then the Bible here says, and bewitched. Now that word bewitched is, Pretty interesting, I thought. It has the idea of influencing their mind. In fact, it has the idea of them, of them, as a result, having an altered state of mind. In truth, the people that listened to Simon the Sorcerer became somewhat insane, somewhat schizophrenic. That seems to be the idea. So the idea of bewitching there, the translator selected a very good word for that. Bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he himself was some great one. So. Uh, he was a servant of Satan. He, uh, he witnessed, according to verse 13, it says there, the power of God. So here's Simon, servant of Satan. He's bewitching people. He's performing magic tricks. He has the power of Satan on his life to influence their minds and to, and to blind their minds to, to things and to, to change. And it was for his own benefit and so that he could... Uh, so that he could um, um, uh, you know, trick them, that kind of thing. And uh, then it says, uh, in verse, anyway, he saw the, uh, these things that were done, saw this great thing. We'll get into the fact that he believed also and he was baptized in just a minute. But he tried to involve himself then from there on in beginning of verse 14 in what the apostles were doing there. And so he wanted to get in on it, if you, if you will, okay? So we need to look at uh, Simon's life, and I'm going to use it as a picture of some of the things that cause bitterness in our own lives. Uh, when, when Pastor Olson preached his message, he gave the roots of bitterness, and he talked a lot about relationship with one another in the church and bitterness there. And so it's a, it was, but I'm going to look at it, it from the perspective of your relationship with the Lord, your personal relationship with God, what causes these things and what he sees. And then so we're going to look at the, our, our Lord as a head of this church, and we're going to look at it from that perspective. Uh, so what did Peter perceive? Verse 20, once again, uh, he begins in verse 20, but then he says in verse uh, 23, for I, 23, for I perceive that thou, that is Simon, art in the gall of bitterness. What was he saying there? That this Simon <clears throat> was immersed, you might say, okay, in bitterness, as if he was dipped in the fluid of bitterness. Now, it's all figurative. It's all metaphorical in meaning. But what he was saying is that Simon's actions were dictated by bitterness, and that what he was doing was dictated because of the bitterness that he felt. And that's how bitterness is. We have some understanding of it. Bitterness takes over your life. It begins to dictate uh, your actions, and it's very difficult to overcome once it gets set in. Very difficult. Um, so, <clears throat> pardon me, and so many of the things that can, there are many things that can make somebody look this way, this in a bitter way. Um, but here, um, <laughs> evidently there was an animosity that Simon was engendering and showed through his face. Um, it has been proven clinically that bitterness can shorten your life. Um, it is, I 
give a personal testimony in my own family or someone's life I believe was shortened and was because of bitterness. Every time you talk to this person, they would talk about how they were slighted. They would talk about how life was, gave them a bad deck of cards, if you will, that kind of thing. They used a lot of metaphorical terms, but they were always saying that, always, always, always. And I think eventually it caused them to live a shorter life. There have been lots of studies that were, were done. In fact, uh, there was a, a longitudinal study. That simply means that they carried that study out for many, many, many years. Um, and there was a group of people that were told to write down uh, personal essays about their lives back in the 1930s. 60 years later, uh, the same group of, uh, a group of researchers who were carrying it on evaluated their essays for positive emotional content. And they found that the people who expressed the most positive emotions lived up to 10 years longer than the ones that didn't. Now, this was 60 years later. So we see a couple of things with that. Number one, it's very difficult, once bitterness sets in, to get rid of it. It's very hard. And then, so it's going to have prolonged long-term effects. Now, um, chronic, it, because bitterness causes stress, and because it's prolonged and it's chronic, this leads to exhaustion, exhaustion, pardon me, weakens the immune system, is linked to lots of, this is a very well-known fact, and headaches, back pain, abdominal pain, and also uh, digestive problems, which may be where the actual bitterness comes from. Now let's look at some bitterness traits. Now here's where uh, you can evaluate yourself. You feel this way, and all I ask you tonight is to be honest with yourself and to be honest with the Lord. It makes no sense whatsoever to deny these things. I'm not trying to convince you of it, but God knows. And I think what he wants us to do is to recognize these things, if indeed you have this problem. So what are some traits of a bitter person? Number one, hurtful remarks. A bitter person will feel oftentimes very slighted and they resent other people's happiness. So as a result, they will lead out, they will lash out, and they will have a, a tendency to purge themselves of, the, of this feeling, and they'll lash out at people. You find your, yourself doing that sometimes? I've done it before. To my shame, I've done that. Hatred, of course, an accumulation of anger, unresolved pain can eventually develop into hatred. Just hatred. And again, that's very, very difficult to rid yourself of. Bitter people also, another trait is, they're implacable. That means you can't satisfy them. No matter what you say, no matter what you try, they're the kind of person that you'll approach them and you try your best to tread softly, but it doesn't matter what you do, they are not going to be pleased, ever, because they're fixated on something. Another characteristic, self-pity. A bitter person feels sorry for themselves. They've been slighted, something's been done to them in their life, and they see themselves, like many liberal people in our world, as victims. And as much as we'll say victim mentality is wrong, the truth of the matter is, if you're bitter here tonight, you have a victim mentality. And it's hard to express gratitude. It's hard to, to, to be thankful. Then, uh, bitter people are hyper aware of perceived slights. A bitter person will say things like this. Did you see the way he looked at me? Did you see the way she looked at me? Why didn't she shake my hand? Why didn't he shake my hand? What's their problem? They are hyper aware of those things and they interpret everything as against them. That's what we might call spitefulness. A bitter person also um, sees everyone else as being the problem. They're not the problem. Everybody else is the problem. As a result, then, they uh, cannot be corrected. If they're convinced that everybody else is the problem, they're not the problem, then a well-to-do person who's going to come out of compassion and love and try to help them, it's not going to work. They won't be helped. Then we have envy and resentment. These things are also character traits. And then I think probably the one thing is selfishness. And here's where we have to be careful because selfishness is something that we all confront. And unchecked, that's going to lead to bitterness. Bitter people are selfish people. It's all about them. They, they fold in. It's all about them. Well, these are these characteristic traits. They're well-known traits of bitterness in somebody's life. 
Now I'm going to go to the book of Ephesians in, in just a minute. And I, I go there because there are some things that I wanted to bring, I wanted to establish some uh, truths from that book because it's a local church letter, okay? So let's go ahead to Ephesians. And uh, if you've got ribbons like I do here, you might leave your place there in Acts. Uh, Ephesians. Chapter 1, verse 1. Who is it written to? It says there, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus. To the saints which are at Ephesus. You might be interested to know that the critical text leaves out the fact at Ephesus and therefore tends to be a very universal church in its doctrine. But the, the words at Ephesus should be there. It clearly delineates a local church. So this, this letter... Paul was written to that local church in, in, uh, in Ephesus and says to end to the faithful <clears throat> in Christ Jesus. So by extension to us, and I'm going to deal with more of that in just a minute. Well, right now, as a matter of fact. So this is what Ephesians is, is written to. So there were members of the church at Ephesus. Let's take ourselves back, all the way back to when Paul wrote this, the original letter. And so it was delivered to the church of Ephesus. They took it, and they probably read it in the next church service, probably, I would think. And they understood there that that letter was written to them. And also, the very first verse, it says also, to the uh, faithful in Christ Jesus. So it was to be, to be disseminated and uh, to different uh, churches and to be copied and to be read. And this is, how, uh, the, the, this is how we have it in our Bible. So it's vital to understand that this epistle is written to a church. And uh, <clears throat> it is, therefore, if it is a church then that church, according to the scriptures, just like our church, and I'm going to make that bridge jump in just a minute, is, according to the Lord, the pillar and ground of the truth. That tells me that this church, all of you in front of me, according to the Lord, according to what he says, we are the pillar and ground of the truth. Okay, the Bible says that in, in, uh, in, in, when Paul writes to Timothy. So in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he says these things, the pillar and ground of truth. Ephesus was the pillar and ground of truth, so are we. Look at Ephesus, uh, Ephesus. Ephesians 3.21. There it says, unto him be glory. It's up here on the banner too, isn't it? Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. So these saints at Ephesus, these members of the church, were to elevate and make Christ preeminent in the church. It's vital to understand that this epistle is written to church and the specific issue then of bitterness that Paul deals with in the Ephesian church in chapter 4, verse 30, uh, is also to any church. Look at verse 30. He says there, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Look at the next verse. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So to say that we are the pillar and ground of the truth, that's, that's quite a lofty title, isn't it? And to say this, but every member of the church then is responsible, just like the members of the church at Ephesus, to obey and to understand, uh, in part, like I'm talking about tonight, how bitterness can affect that church. And, and, and what does it do? It grieves God's spirit. If God's spirit is grieved, then, uh, it, they, then there's there's going to be a problem. He's not going to be working in the church like he should. And I think you understand that the Lord put his stamp of approval on the church. The church is the place, is the appointed of institution, we're going to get to this in a little bit, in the last days. It's, to, it's right here. This is the lo this local church. And so he's very concerned with what goes on in this church. The Lord is very concerned. He looks at, he knows everything that's going on in your life, and he's concerned about it. Um, the sermon on Thursday, Dr. Vogel, I left there thinking to myself, the Lord cares about what goes on in the church. He cares about the way we look. He cares about the way we dress. He cares about, you know, the numbers of hairs, our head, all of these things. That should be a blessed thought, that the Lord cares about it. He's concerned about it. So he looks at, at our lives. And uh, as it says in Ephesians 5 later on, that he may present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. So the thought that God wants to, pur to purge his church and make it a holy church ought to be a blessed thought because he cares about us. We're not orphans. God cares about us. And he's concerned with it. So does he know and is he concerned and is he looking um, to make sure that we're right in this area of bitterness? Of course, he specifically places it there. And it always has a negative effect on a church. This is the Lord's church. 
<coughs> please, if, if you can connect bitterness in the church to the fact that it's the Lord's church that you or I might be bitter in, that, that's really the point. And so uh, it always affects the church negatively, and it has affected, I believe, our church, and perhaps it still is. So we can't get away from it. To, to maintain and to harbor bitter thoughts and a bitter spirit is going to grieve God's spirit, and it's going to have a, ne a negative effect on our church. In the first three cha uh, chapters of, of Ephesians, the, the, uh, Paul there deals with the blessedness of salvation in the members of the church. When he gets to chapter 4, look at chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, therefore, what therefore? Therefore, because of all the blessings of salvation and church membership, because of that, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, urge you, that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. What is the vocation wherewith we are called? We could read chapters 1 through 3, and we'll see that. But we are to walk, this is the beginning of a series of commandments. At this point, then, many, chapters 4 through <coughs> 6, pardon me, are lots of commandments. The Lord commands things, okay? Because all of this then culminates in the understanding that if we obey these things, we're walking worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. So we apply this to Fairhaven Baptist Church, just like it was applied to Ephesians Baptist Church. And I say Baptist because they were immersed uh, believers, just like we are. So, so then uh, there's this uh, long line of commands. And so by extension then, we receive this to be for ourselves. We know this is true <clears throat> because these epistles are written to saints in the last days. Uh, this is defined, the last days that is, from the day that Jesus ascended until the time he comes back again. Go to Acts chapter 2, verse 17. I'm going to try to reach a point here. Acts 2, 17 says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. So here, the church uh, receives the gift of the Holy Spirit here in Acts chapter 2. And... Uh, he says, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. And so here he is, he's quoting the book of Joel. And uh, there Joel also uses <clears throat> and is speaking of the day of the Lord. <coughs> so this last days there uh, is defined then here in Acts chapter 2 to be, uh, of course, right here the Lord had ascended just shortly before that time. And then these last days is connected with his return again. <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter 1, you don't have to turn there, but in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 it says this. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, so this would be the Old Testament, hath in these last days, notice that, so who are, the Paul there is writing to uh, some people in the book of Hebrews, and he calls it the last days then, has spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. <clears throat> so... Uh, Peter goes on to say, knowing this verse, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. We've memorized 1 Timothy chapter 3. Right? In the last days, perilous times shall come. So this last days uh, is connected with the, the Lord's coming back again. Uh, and that's, we see that in 2 Peter chapter 3, where it says there uh, that there will be scoffers in the last days. And they'll say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. The fact that he's going to be heir of all things, the fact that he's going to come again, tells us and is linked with the last days. So the last days is from when the Lord left until he comes back again. If that's true and the Lord hasn't returned yet, what's the conclusion? That we're living in the last days. So all then that is... Uh, that it pertains to that, and all these epistles pertain to Fairhaven Baptist Church just like it does to all the churches they were written to. So we conclude, therefore, that bitterness causes a grieving of the Holy Spirit of God at Fairhaven Baptist Church just like it did at the Church of Ephesus. Now, in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, <clears throat> there we are commanded, one of the commandments, I, I mentioned before there's lots of commandments, but one of the commandments is to put off the old man which evidently, in part, is characterized by bitterness. We're to put that off. We're to just put it off. Now, I don't know what, that, what kind of image that evokes in your mind, but I think it's just the idea of, um, of, of remembering that we're no, more, no longer uh, underneath the bondage of sin and that we can just let it go. We remind ourselves of that. <coughs> and so uh, we put off the old man, which evidently was characterized by the bitterness, and then put on the new man, which is not characterized so. Okay, so my point then is this. 
Bitterness grieves God's spirit. Because it grieves God's spirit, and because we're living in the last days, and, and our church then is responsible to evaluate our own lives, to see if bitterness is in our lives, and I'm going to look, go back to Acts chapter 8, and we're going to look at Simon the sorcerer and see what things were in his life that uh, caused him to become bitter. Bitterness is maybe, it seems to me, is a further extent of sin. Once it gets to the point of bitterness, the Bible talks about it being a root of bitterness in Hebrews 12 and uh, springing up. So it's rooted. Once it becomes bitterness, it becomes rooted in our life. I think this is the, the understanding. And so there are elements or there are things that lead to bitterness. So if we can cut it off be, at, before it gets to that point, we will certainly be better off. And so what are the things then in Simon Sor the sorcerer's life that led to this him being in the bond of iniquity and the gall of bitterness, that if we'll pay attention to these things, it'll help us to not get to that point. Well, the first thing I see in verse 9, so if we go back to Acts chapter 8, in verse 9, it says there, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery <coughs> and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that for a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. I see the first thing that ended up producing bitterness in um, Simon the Sorcerer's life, and it could be in our, is simply the, the idea of selfishness. He was a self-proclaimed one, it says. He self-proclaimed. He, he was uh, somebody that made himself out to be this great one. It was all about himself. Um, people that uh, enjoy a measure of popularity <clears throat> uh, often don't like it when things reflect bad on them. There are lots of people sometimes where they're embarrassed about something and because they're selfish, they, that, that turns into bitterness. Maybe in their own lives, maybe in their kids, maybe in whatever. <coughs> we tend to feel, because of our selfishness, we tend to feel uh, that we're, we don't, we don't, we're not worthy of that sort of thing and we become bitter. When someone is selfish they don't, and they don't get what they want, then they become bitter to the point of even lunacy. I have seen... Uh, people do things that would be considered completely lunatic, literally insane things, and it's because selfishness drew, drove them insane. So, uh, selfishness definitely leads to bitterness. I wonder, um, of, of course everybody some, some, some time to another will feel and, and sense this idea of selfishness, and we have to confront this, and we have to give ourselves to other people, and we can't be selfish. In uh, Satan has a way of giving us just enough to where we'll want more, and then it is to deceive us. This is the way Satan works. Sometimes he'll um, even do great things, even miraculous things, and uh, the idea will be uh, eventually to, um, to uh, cause people to be... To, to be uh, Oh, the word isn't coming. Deceived. Okay. So go to Revelation 13. I want to show you something. <clears throat> this is an example of what I'm talking about. In Revelation 13, we have Satan doing, performing great things in, in the last uh, times there. And in verse uh, 1 through 9, um, I don't think I'll read all of it, but we can see in <clears throat> Revelation 13, So it says in verse 4, and they worshiped the dragon. Sorry, let's go to verse um, 2. And the beast of which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? Okay, now, let me stop there for a second. So here, the beast, um, and uh, through satanic influence here, does great things. Evidently, there was some image that was, uh, it was wounded, and uh, then the great miracle, they came back to life as it were, and so miracles were happening. All right, so Satan was working in, in that time. This is during the tribulation. But notice in verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. I, I read that, and I think to myself, what does performing miracles and having a wounded head come back to life again have to do with blasphemy. Why would they blaspheme God because of that? 
That's where the deception is. So you see, Satan will lead people uh, through uh, magic or what it was like, Simon, to deceive people uh, into eventually blaspheming God. And this is where it leads to. And so Simon was receiving this admiration. He was a selfish person. He wanted, uh, he coveted all that attention that he'd received. And uh, so uh, Satan allowed him to have just enough for him to be deceived just enough to where um, it caused other people to even to go against the things of God. But when, when Philip came and, and, and they saw the power of God, then things changed, praise the Lord. But this is how Satan works. And oftentimes it works through uh, bitterness. Uh, there is a depth then to which Satan gives out to people. And sometimes popularity and, and, and especially those things that, and so Satan will always lead you to be selfish. He'll always lead you to think of yourself, always. Uh, in fact, the church of Satan has uh, their golden rule also. It is this, uh, whatsoever thou doest is, shall be the whole of the law. And so Satan doesn't say worship me. He says worship yourself. So this idea of selfishness <clears throat> is satanic in nature. And, when, and, and we are not ignorant of, of Satan's devices. And he causes people to have selfish sentiment. And then ultimately, however, the deception is that leads, of course, to bitterness. So... Um, so Satan gives a little bit, a little bit at a time. He doesn't come and, and explode these things, just a little bit at a time and until he can get somebody to be selfish to want more of that sort of thing. And so this is where um, Christians that grew up in a very good church will oftentimes end up listening to music that is not right. It happens little by little, okay? And, and, and then it it's, uh, <clears throat> becomes full-blown, immodesty. See, this is where uh, standards are so very important in the church. Because it allows, you, it allows us to have a line. I don't, um, I don't understand why people would go against those things. Why you wouldn't support completely the standards in your church. It's what keeps us where we should be. It's what helps us not to step over the line. Uh, I'll give you an example. A young lady may grow up in a good church. Maybe begins to dress a little bit provocatively maybe. Or doesn't take, is not as careful as she should be. And then she gets a little bit of attention. Then it becomes selfish. At that point, then Satan has that young lady. And she'll begin to be selfish. And bitterness follows that. She becomes in the bond of iniquity. And what happens? She'll blaspheme and speak against those people who love her and are trying to help her. Now her mom and dad is, is, is the enemy. Now the church is the enemy. Now all of these things. And with the young man, it's the same thing. In different ways, granted, but it's the same idea. It's all selfishness. <clears throat> bitterness is the bond of iniquity, and selfishness is, is at the start of it many times. Um, so are you careful? Are you careful about how selfish you might be? Do you ask the Lord frequently, Lord, am I selfish in my heart? Is, do I have a problem here? Do you ask him? He's looking. He wants to hear it from you. But do you ask him, are you careful about your selfishness? The second thing that I think causes a bitterness is jealousy. So we go back to Acts chapter 8, verse 12. We see there, uh, but when they be believed to Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And Simon himself was believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. Well, I think it's pretty clear here that uh, Simon wanted something that he didn't have. What Satan had given him before wasn't enough. And uh, you might say, uh, because uh, Philip and Peter and John were preaching and teaching the truth, and they, these people turned from their bewitchedness and began to serve God and to do the right thing, they took some of his business, you might say. <clears throat> and so it says in verse 12 that they believed. Look at verse 12 again. But when they believed, what is the antecedent for they? In other words, who is they replacing? What's referring to the people that before uh, Simon had bewitched? <coughs> so again, uh, essentially, Philip took away his business. And then it goes on to, to say that Simon believed, and then he was even baptized. So here's a good place to discuss whether Simon was actually saved or not. I think that um, the fact that it says he believed and he was baptized, anybody that profess, uh, professes pardon me, belief in these things the church is obliged to baptize that person. I don't think that's what the issue is. The issue is, what did he believe in? I go to verse 18, and notice there it says, and when Simon saw that through laying on the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Evidently, from that verse, I think the implication was 
that the, that the Holy Spirit was not given the sign. That's why he wanted to purchase it with money, because he didn't have it. If he had already had it, why would he want to purchase it? So this would pretty seem to indicate that he was not a saved person. And so as a, as a result then, he, his uh, intentions were jealous and selfish. He wasn't cured. He wasn't uh, uh, of the, like, the, like the they people were. They turned from their bewitchedness and they got right with the Lord, but Simon, I don't think it ever did. And so he had this sin problem. And uh, so I'm going to take the angle that he wasn't saved. But whether he was, if you say think he was, and, and that's fine, it still doesn't change the fact that Simon certainly operated out of jealousy. And uh, that certainly leads to bitterness. Uh, sometimes in the Bible, jealousy is used in a positive sense. The Bible says that God is jealous, is, is a jealous God. He says, for the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Well, there it's certainly used positively. And 2 Corinthians 11.2 says, for I am jealous, the Lord is speaking through Paul, for I am jealous over you, that is the church at Corinth, with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin, a chaste virgin to Christ. But the bad kind of jealousy is quite the opposite. It is destructive, and it causes one to sow discord among the brethren. Uh, jealousy, of course, is being envious or resentful of either the good fortune of somebody, or maybe the way somebody looks, or maybe the abilities that that person has. Maybe they're because they're intelligent. Maybe they're good at sports. Maybe they're pretty. Maybe they're beautiful. Maybe they're naturally thin. Whatever. And we can become jealous, just like Simon was jealous of that power that Peter and uh, Philip and John had. So I, I wonder, just like selfishness, do you often ask the Lord if, there, if there's any jealousy in your heart at all? If there's any heart of jealousy whatsoever there? Do you, do you desire to have it rid of? Do you desire to have a clean heart that way? Are you careful about what you ask the Lord for there? <clears throat> The Bible says in Hebrews 12, uh, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. The bond of iniquity being defiled, this is the way the Bible presents that. Interesting report, <clears throat> about three years ago, uh, there was an organization that published a report that ranked all 50 states on sinfulness. Uh, for its report, the <coughs> this website analyzed the states based on certain metrics. Now, metrics are simply, uh, you know, topics. In seven categories, including anger and hatred, what state has the most angry and hateful people? What state has the state of the union has the most jealous people? The state of the union has the most excess and vices, the most greed, lust, vanity, laziness, and there were about 47 categories. Well, they found, and I don't think what I'm going to tell you here is much of a surprise, that the, that the state that is the most sinful is Nevada. What stays in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas, right? So that, that's certainly uh, that state. And so there, there's this. The, the least one, you might be surprised, was Vermont. You'll be happy to know that Indiana was one of the least sinful, so that's a good thing. <laughs> but jealousy is evidently a problem, isn't it? And it's one of the vices that causes uh, things to be bad. And uh, so jealousy is uh, something we have to deal with. So again, my question is, are you, are you dealing with that? Is it something that you're careful about as, as selfishness? The third thing I think that led to Simon Sorcerer's bitterness is, and this goes along with it, I see in verse 19, back to chap Acts chapter 8, verse 19. There it says, saying, give me also this power. He says, give me this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. So give me this power that I lay my hands. It's very selfish, we see it there. But I think uh, Simon here was coveting, wasn't he? And I preached on covetousness not too long ago, but uh, this comes from a, a heart of pride. And so it's a longing for things that belong to another, uh, being greedy. Uh, this covetousness will build pressure, if not checked, and eventually cause you to do things you never thought you would do. Um, so there are lots of verses concerning covetousness, but I can remember, let me just start with an example. I can remember, I might have said this when I preached before, I don't remember. But I can remember filling up our buses before, um, not, not these, but a, a different church, and I would go to a gas station, it was kind of larger, so I could pull the buses in there and fill them up. 
And I heard a Harley Davidson motorcycle. I think I used this before. And they, so the person pulled up to the gas pump, and it was brand new. And it was in the summertime, right about this time. And it was gleaming blue. It was a beautiful motorcycle, and chrome and everything. It was beautiful. And so I thought to myself, the person riding that has got to be very, very pleased, and probably very happy. And there was a sour look on his face. And I thought to myself, evidently, and it was just a, a very obvious um, object lesson to me, that things just don't pr produce contentment. And uh, so uh, this covetousness, unchecked, uh, causes problems and will lead to bitterness for sure. Uh, now we know the Bible says not to uh, covet. It says that in Exodus chapter 20. It's one of the Ten Commandments. In Psalm 10, verse 3, it says, For the wicked boast of, uh, boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. So according to Psalm 10, the Lord abhors covetousness. Uh, then it says in Ephesians 5, but fornication and all cleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint. So when the Lord looks at our church and he's looking at the heart of each and every one of us, he does not expect any of us to be covetous in any way. For this you know that no whoremonger or unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater, so it's linked with idolatry there, so it says uh, that hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of Christ and of God, let no man deceive you with in vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers of with them. Let me remind you, not one time, not once, not one single time named among us. Not once. That's the commandment. Um, in 2 Timothy 3, we know this. Uh, we've been memorizing this, if you have. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, and so forth. I can remember years ago, and this is one of these things that happened in my life, I'll never ever forget it. It was uh, it's just one of those things. I was going to, I was taking classes at Purdue, uh, this was back in, I don't know, maybe 88, 89, around that time. And uh, calculus class was in the morning. So I would show up there, and we'd go right to calculus class. And one of the young men that were, was in the class there with me, he had a motorcycle. And in the parking lot of, of Purdue at that time, maybe it's still that way, the motorcycles would park in the front. They had a special section there for the motorcycle. So I parked back here. I found a spot back here. He pulled in on his motorcycle, and I saw him a little up there in a the ways, and he parked his motorcycle there. If I remember right, he turned around, he saw me, and we waved at each other, and uh, so we were going to class. Uh, right about that time, <clears throat> I think he had just taken over, off his helmet, we heard a, a, a shotgun blast. It was a, a shotgun went off. It was unmistakable. And then we heard screaming. So we thought, what? And then it stopped, and then there was a, there was a very eerie nothing after that. So uh, he was, he happened further up a ways, and because he was closer, he kind of jogged over to see if he could help, and I was kind of walking that way. And uh, when he came back, uh, he basically indicated to me, you don't want to go over there. Don't go over there, let's just go to class. You don't want to see that. And so I, I asked him, what, what happened? And he said, well, somebody just shot themselves. They put a shotgun in their mouth and just pulled the trigger and shot themselves. The scream we heard afterwards was a young lady that was there. Well, it turns out that that young lady had just broken up with that young man, and out of spite and jealousy, because she was seeing somebody else, he was going to make her pay for it and shot himself right in front of her. Blew out the back window of the car and everything. That's one of those things you can imagine. I, I, thankfully, I didn't see it. But uh, that young man that saw it, his face was flushed white. He could not, it was very, very, it affected him great, as you can imagine, because he saw it. And uh, it just reminded me, that's jealousness and selfishness and covetousness will drive you completely insane. And it leads to bitterness. And then I think one more thing that leads to bitterness, we back in Acts chapter 8, verse 20. <clears throat> but Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. See, I think it's pretty obvious that Simon thought that what Peter and uh, Philip and John had could be given to him and he could pay for it, that it was a commodity, okay? It was something that, he could, that could be bought, bought and sold. So it was something that he thought was in their possession and that they could give it to him. 
Okay, now this coming from, of course, his, his background, it would make sense that he would think that way. But I, I, I was thinking about this, and I thought, what was Simon really doing? What was the, the real bad thing here about saying that? It was this, that he was misrepresenting the power of God. It, wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with Philip, did it? It had anything to do with Peter, had nothing to do with John. That what was happening was the power of God, wasn't it? It wasn't them, but Simon misrepresented that. And so I, I get to thinking, you know, that, that you may not immediately link that with bitterness, but it is. In other words, if we don't hold Christ as preeminent in our church, and that everything that happens here and all the blessings and everything come from him and him alone and him foremost, and if we apply those things to man in any way, then the arm of the flesh fails us and we'll be bitter people at the end of it. This is what Simon did. I think about in the Old Testament, Nadab and Abihu, they were serving the Lord as part of the priesthood, but they didn't do it according to thus saith the Lord. And they, uh, in their uh, fleshly way of thinking, because they wanted to be preeminent themselves, they went ahead, got ahead of the Lord and it didn't work out for them. Uzzah, the same thing. He was serving the Lord. He was doing a good thing. But he, but he didn't, he misrepresented those things, and he took it upon himself to, to, to steady the ark. <clears throat> now, I hope you get this point. As a church, we must allow the, word, the Lord to take the reins of the church. You individually are responsible for your own actions, not the actions of others. Uh, after all, according to 1 Peter chapter 5, this is the flock of God. It's God's flock. It's his church. And some people believe that they are, I think sometimes, the watch care over the church. Like they're the ones that have got to know everything and have got to make all the decisions. You've got to make sure that everything happens the way it's supposed to. And I think what we miss in a lot of that is that this, this people in front of me is not, this is the Lord's church. The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of this church. Not you, and not me, and not anybody else. It's him. And if we'll just let the Lord work things out, let him do it, he'll do it. He always has, and he always will. The Lord Jesus Christ is to have the preeminence in our church, and if you don't keep that in your mind, you'll end up being a bitter person. And I hope that isn't the case. So whatever problems you might think are insurmountable, um, it's not the church. Let's just make sure that Christ is held up and, and, and that we're responsible to do that. The Lord will take care of those things. Um, so what do we need to do? What's the balm, you might say, for bitterness? We just need to forgive. What did, what did it say in Acts 8, verse 22? What did Peter say to uh, Simon the sorcerer? He very simply says, repent therefore, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. And I would say tonight, and i got one closing illustration, but I would say tonight that you may need to confess this. You may need to repent of this selfishness or jealousy or covetousness or not holding up Christ as the head and assuming that responsibility yourself. Confess those things. Repent of that and confess it and get right. Remember I said before, it's your relationship with the Lord. He is preeminent in our church. You might have heard of a ship called the Pelicano. Uh, that's a ship that uh, is probably infamous, maybe the most infamous ship. It's, it is known as the ship that nobody wanted. It was literally sailing the seas as an unwanted ship, I think, for years. The crew there was trying to find a place to unload the cargo of the ship, and nobody wanted it. It had nothing to do with the crew, <clears throat> had nothing to do with the captain, had nothing to do with the ship. It was quite seaworthy, nothing to do at all. It had to do with the fact that that ship was filled with trash. In 1986, in Philadelphia, there was a strike, and the garbage built. I think there's a very faint memory in my mind about that. And the garbage was just filling up because the, gar the trash workers weren't working anymore. They went on strike, so the garbage just piled up and piled up and piled up. Well, the owner of, the, of the, this ship decided they were going to turn a quick dollar and that they would take all of that trash and find a place to put it and that they'd make a quick you know, buck or whatever. So they burned all the trash and they dumped this unbelievable amounts of, of trash and ash inside the, the belly of the ship or whatever. And then they tried to find a place to stop. Wherever they, or anywhere they went to, and we're talking about worldwide, nobody wanted it because that ship was filled with trash. 
You know, our hearts can be that way sometimes. And nobody's going to want you. Nobody's going to want those things because our heart is filled and is dirty and is trashy. Now, you're selfish maybe tonight, jealous, covetousness. Maybe you're not holding up crisis and letting him take care of things. You're taking it upon your own self. I hope that uh, maybe the Lord revealed some things to you. And uh, maybe you're not asking the Lord to cleanse you of this. I, I admit, I don't always do that myself. I don't ask the Lord to look to see if there's selfishness in my heart, if there's jealous covetousness, if I'm not holding him up preeminent. I don't do that. I should. I don't do it like I should. So may the Lord bless you then, and uh, may you receive this the way that he would intend for us to receive it. Let's pray.